What's up guys, it's State of Soccer. And today to kickstart things, we're gonna do something a little bit different. I actually have one of my favorite books, The Art of War in front of me. I wanna read a passage from it for you guys. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. So today, let's get to know our enemy, the Canadian men's soccer team. What's up guys, it's State of Soccer. I'm back for another episode. We talk about all things US men's national team, domestic and abroad. But today, we're actually not gonna be talking about the state of the USMNT, but more about the state of Canadian soccer. And joining me today, I don't have an enemy, but more of a friend of State of Soccer, Josh from JJ, JJD TV. How are you doing? Good, JJD TV can be a tongue twister, eh? A lot, a lot of people get the, get the confidence going, they're like, and JJD TV. <laughs> um, it's, it's, yeah, you like it. No, but I'm doing good, man. I appreciate you uh, being patient because uh, we've tried to do a, a video together for a while now, but we we're finally able to make it work. Made you still wait about 15 minutes, but I'm excited to be here and excited to talk with you today. You're good, man. I'm excited you could finally join. And uh, we want to hear about the Canadian side, what's going on north of the border, because things are definitely heating up, you know, despite it being cold over there. Yeah. So yeah. summary of Canadian soccer in 2021, if you could give me like a two sentence summary how do you think the year one? Two sentences. Okay. Um, successful. Um, I two sentences. Yeah, you got me. Got me in the rope. <laughs> it was. Uh, it, it, just, yeah. it, it was just. It was so, like something like I've never experienced before. I mean, I didn't know I would be on YouTube doing Canadian soccer content. I just it kind of found me. Sure. It was just like all of a sudden, oh my, our national team's playing, man. Like. I, I want to talk about it. I'm, I'm, I think it's so incredible seeing all these stories, all these pieces that could come together. I was so curious to see what this team would look like. And their first match was in January of, of 2021. So it's been a full year of me covering the team. And I just kind of went head first, not knowing what to expect. And, and it's been a lot of fun, not only with the engagement that I've had, because I've been right in the inner circle from the get go pretty much. Cause it's been a year before that first game in January. And then to see the success and the, Oh, I'd say overachievement of this side so far has been absolutely incredible. And yeah, I guess if you made me try to summarize that down, I've just been grateful and excited to see this next generation come up and uh, looking forward to seeing what they can do for the rest of this window and hopefully qualify for the World Cup. Yeah, we want to get into that today. Your thoughts on this upcoming window, qualification, expectations for Qatar, if they can qualify, so it's like they will. And that's kind of what I want to talk about, the hype right now. I know you probably think, you know, you believe the hype is real. Um, obviously, the players that you guys will look at their at the projected, you know, the depth chart here for Canada. But Canadian fans, you know, do you all feel that the hype is real or is there still kind of that imposter syndrome? Uh, the hype's definitely real just because, like, I, I was talking about this yesterday. It's it's mm -hmm. unprecedented territory for the Canadian national team. I mean, I'm 25 years old and I've followed our national team as closely as I could because there's only so much you can almost follow up until now because yeah. there's been not a lot of success. It's always been fun. I always like watching the Gold Cup, seeing if we could ever overachieve. And I wasn't really aware of what was going on when we won the 2000 Gold Cup, but there's been some pretty dark days being a, a Canadian men's national team <laughs> fan. Yeah. And just to see the program and, and the success and obviously starting a new league as well, which it's all, all that kind of comes together, a, a very strong manager targeting dual nationals, having a project, having a goal in mind. Uh, it's been pretty cool. And on top of that, there's there's actual real buy-in. I've always felt like in Canada, especially in, in big cities, a lot of soccer fans have their other background, um, whether it be yeah. Portugal, Italy. That's kind of where it, these Canadians went. They, they, they cheered because it, it, it was never really – I didn't really have a, the biggest background. I'm Canadian through and through. Okay. Um, but my background is Germany. So, like, I mean, World Cups, so I'd always, you know, cheer for, the, <laughs> for Germany because Canada was never close, ever close to making one. And now that it's time to actually support them, it's it's a lot of all I think about. And, and I think a lot of people are jumping on the excitement. And and that's why, I mean, if you're on Twitter, you'll see a little little back and forth as the, the some some US fans are out there just like, whoa, 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 relax, relax. It's it's uh it's you haven't done anything quite yet, which is totally fair. But I think that the excitement is is awesome for the country. Sure. And I'm I'm really hoping that uh, we can get over the line and make it to Qatar. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, that's a cool backdrop, by the way, as far as, as nice. far as like, well, this, this graphic and then you, like your, your background, it's so 
incredible to me. Obviously, similar to the U.S. and it's a melting pot. Canada it seems to be the same way. Montreal, Toronto, um, you know, even Vancouver, the out, out west, larger cities. Um, we obviously know that Toronto FC and Toronto itself has a huge Italian um, population, which you're seeing Lorenzo and Signe. Yeah. Um, Montreal being, you know, obviously Quebec, Quebecois culture, and everything like that. So. <laughs> for yeah that makes complete sense so it's cool that finally there's a team that you guys can all unify around which is the canadian men's national team and for good reason too because i'm looking at some of these names and obviously not just the names but the, the teams that these players are playing for and the one thing that i like about this graphic is it kind of lets that be known right i mean you're looking at these are all european clubs essentially and if they're not european clubs they're canadian clubs it's toronto or vancouver which is cool to see too or montreal um but a couple of players that I really want to talk about right now, Kyle Lauren and Jonathan David, as far as latest transfer rumors going on, um, you know, if you want to kind of touch upon that, we'll touch upon uh, Jonathan David first. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan David is obviously just becoming so successful. Everything that kind of gets thrown in front of him, he's he's matched, and he had a really he struggled really hard when he first went to to Liga and when he went to Lille because he just it, it almost looked like he bit off a little bit more that he could chew at first. The goals weren't coming. He was looking frustrated. And then come 2021, he just blew up. And he had such a successful end to the season, obviously with the unprecedented league on title that Lil brought home. Surprised everyone. He was a big part of that with a, a good duo up front playing in that 4-4-2 system. Yeah. And then he continued it this year. And his agents come out and they basically said he's done what he had to do at Lil. They are looking for different moves. And he's been linked to a lot of different clubs. Uh, the Premier League continually comes up. I mean... Arsenal, um, I think Tottenham a little bit. I, I, I wouldn't look too much into those, but Liverpool was a big one that was reported on a, a lot. Yep. Um, PSG has been coming there. Inter Milan, which to me makes a lot of sense just given their, their style of play. So there's some big leagues around looking at him. I even I didn't hear specific teams. Well, I, I did. They, they said Madrid, Real Madrid, and out of La Liga was looking at it. I didn't I didn't know too much on that one. I don't know if that one made a, a ton of sense to me, but like it just shows the kind of hype that he's getting and, and the big... Uh, 55 mil price tag that's on him on him now. I mean, he, he's a player that's doing it, and he's not only doing it for Lille and Ligon still, he's doing it at the Champions League, getting Lille out of the group stage, which was a big achievement, sure. and on top of that, doing it at national level. So it's it's pretty exciting to see where his next step will be, but this will definitely, from what I understand, be his last season at Lille. $55 million price tag probably puts him in the range of third in CONCACAF right now, I'd say. Transfer market, maybe fourth. I, I think second, second, I thought. I, I could well, be wrong. Pulisic I thought Pulisic like, dropped. He, down. Probably dro he probably dropped off. It's yeah, I think it goes Davies, David, and then Pulisic at around 40. And I think I think Lozano dropped too. But I, I think he's second on the, the most updated one. Yeah, and I saw McKenney is up there a little bit more than he was previously. He's gone up. Um, now, Kyle Lauren, another player that we saw stateside in Orlando, made the move over abroad. He's now playing in Turkey. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on Kyle Lauren as far as transfer rumors? I mean, he's been linked to West Ham. I think even a little bit Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really want to see him go to the Prem. I kind of want to see him go in to, to Liga, uh, and he's actually been linked to Marseille, and now there's recent links to Lille. And I think it would just be so perfect to see Jonathan David go on to make his next move, and then Kyle Lauren take his place at Lille. I'd like to see him maybe go to, to Marseille or, or maybe that, but I want him to play. And it's a, it's a big, interesting debate when you're like a big national team supporter, because it's nice and, and it's, it's amazing to think, Oh, Jonathan David going to Real Madrid or, or Kyle Lahren going to the Prem, but I want them to play. I want them to, yeah. to play at the best level, but I want them to get minutes. I want them to find a success in whatever league that is. And I just feel like, and I was really adamant about seeing Laren go to Marseille because I thought that would have been a good fit for him. Now Lille's coming up, and I just feel like in Ligue 1, that'd be a good step from him coming from the Turkish League if he got minutes at West Ham, which isn't a guarantee considering that they have some striker options as well. I'm not against that. Uh, but I think it, it there's a chance that he moves on as well, and it's looking like the possibility is down to either France or England. What's crazy is you mentioned West Ham, you mentioned Lille, you, you mentioned Marseille. Everywhere he could possibly go right now. I mean, there are CONCACAF talent at each one of those teams too, right? You know, West Ham, um, Mikel Antonio, who's currently the striker there. Um, you know, Marseille, obviously, Conor de la Fuente, Timothy Wea at Lille. I personally think it'd be awesome if you could slot right into Lille. I mean, how how much better is a job when you're referenced and you know people and you come in and, um, you know, Jonathan David, 
can talk to management and say, hey, this is the type of player you're getting, and they, they know what to expect. So I think that would be great if you could slot him in there. Yeah, it would be it'd be funny. One Canadian goes, like, you've, you've made me develop this love for Lille. Now another one gets to slot right back in there. Uh, but I, I want to be realistic with Laren because I he's such an important player to this national team. And there's there's opportunities for him to start in front of David, which is crazy to see just given on Herdman's system. You've seen Laren start in front of Jonathan David. Um, and I want him to continue his game because I think he's done some incredible things in Turkey. I think he deserves a move, but I, it needs to be a strategic because we've seen the Prem eat players up and not be that fit and i think it has to be the exact right move to give him opportunity to get minutes to get comfortable to get to know the league and i'm not saying that west ham can't be a good fit i'm i just want to see that that opening and when i look at lil and i'm looking at david moving at the end of the season i'm looking at that opening and i'm looking at laren coming in i think i think that'd be a perfect fit personally but we'll, we'll see what happens here now canadian depth i said it before it's a real thing um looking at all these other names out here let's pick a couple spots where there is a lack of depth right and that's what i'm interested in you know when we're reading about this to know your enemy right <laughs> so if we're gonna if we're gonna have 100 battles 100 games in the future where can the u.s kind of beat up on canada um you know we can talk in a future episode about the u.s but right away i look at the center back position with vittoria i don't know your thoughts on vittoria and the depth that follows if you want to f focus in there just to start. Yeah, looking specifically at depth, I mean, it's not, I'm not breaking anyone's, um, like, whoa, no way. I, I, everyone knows that the the depth lacks at the at the center back position. Um, and it, it's it's nice to see players come up. I mean, Kamal Miller has taken a massive, mm -hmm. massive step in 2021 through his performances at Gold Cup, got a lot of people's attention. Now he's a vital piece of that. Scott Kennedy's coming up as well. Victoria is still, he still does it at the CONCACAF level. I, I'm very comfortable with him at the back. He's a set piece specialist as well, uh, but he's 34. He's get he's getting older. I don't have a lot of faith in in Henry starting matches. Manjikar James is not really in the, the thick of things anymore. Uh, Cornelius, he was kind of put out in the wild, kind of got brought in a little bit. So there's definitely a massive massive step in there and we play in a back three so you could arguably put Alistair Johnson in there as well because we have that that back three with Kamal Miller out on the left Alistair Johnson on the right and then the big man Vittoria in the middle but behind that I, I it's a big downgrade when you have Henry starting in the middle over Vittoria you don't have another option for Alistair Johnson at the outside right center back position right now and on outside left you have Cornelius and Kennedy who, who do do a decent job so I'm looking at the outside right center back and I'm looking at the central center back for for holes in that team and on top of that, this is just a little bit of information because I'm not saying that it's a massive weakness at any stretch, but with uh, the Serbian league being put on a, a big winter break and then the MLS not being in, our keepers aren't playing. Now, I mean, you guys obviously are able to relate to that somewhat with Stefan obviously being a backup keeper. Backup, yep. um, so you can take a bit what you will. Maybe it affects them, maybe it doesn't, but it's interesting to note that Borian and Crepo will not have a ton of minutes, which is why I think this Guatemala game on the 22nd will be important to see if both of them are included and to get just some game time before the game against Honduras. Yeah, but there's anyone who's going to step up. It's it's Borian. We, we, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I hear you, though. I hear you. And the fact that he plays in Serbia, that club, I, I'm sure everyone, I'll throw a clip here on here of, of the fans going crazy, but the atmosphere day in and day out there is wild. I don't know if you guys yeah. see that. Yeah, there, there's some, there's definitely some cool clips from out there. I think they said it was one of the most dangerous derbies somewhere in the one of the Serbian derbies. I can't remember. It was a video yeah. I saw. They were just going crazy, wrecking yeah. crap, doing the flares, and uh, yeah, it's it's a hostile environment. Um, it was, it was someone was vlogging like going to the most dangerous derby oh, in the world man, or something no. like that. It's not away days. It's it's another channel. I'll put no, oh, yeah. <laughs> below. Yeah, but it's pretty cool. Uh, Copenhagen, I think, went there. Definitely mm. Copenhagen. Um, now, a couple guys who aren't on this list, Jaquil Marshall Rudy, you know, young prospect, 17 years old, a forward who's showing tons of promise, obviously at uh, TFC. Thoughts on him and then other notable prospects that are out there that might not be on this list? Yeah, Mar off. Marshall Rudy is, a, is an interesting one. There's been a lot of uh, pictures circulating from him going to like mm -hmm. look with Arsenal, Liverpool. He's a very talented young player who's kind of been that right back, right wing back, right attacking mid type role. We kind of unknown exactly where he's going to fit because he's still so young and so it can develop on that that right hand side uh, i'm very curious to see what his next move will be a lot of I know a lot of canadian fans want him to stay in tc just to get that little bit more experience i'd love to see him make that jump m go to the prem um but again it's, it's strategic because we've seen other players like corbiano and liam miller be with liverpool be with yeah. wolves haven't gotten those opportunities so his next 
it, it is cool thinking that, okay, he's linked with potentially joining up with Liverpool and potentially joining up with Arsenal, but it, 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 there's still a long way to go for him, but he's definitely an exciting young talent. And I think that his next move could be a, a very important one to see what the development of the player is going to look like. Uh, and on top of that, these are kind of dual, a couple dual nationals to think of. Um, Mitrovic is joining up with uh, I, us, I believe, for the, the 22nd. He's obviously eligible to represent yeah. Serbia as well. Very talented young midfielder. He'd be important in that uh, that midfield cluster in there. Uh, very creative. And it seems from social media that he's leaning towards Canada, which is which is fantastic. Another another young player is Daniel Jebson, who is not yeah, he's not on, not on the list. He's he's eligible for England as well. He's he's a Sheffield United player on loan down at Burton Alban in the in the third division in England and uh, he's one that's been on everyone's radar for a long time. It'd, like, it'd be great to see him potentially commit because I'm still looking at that striker depth and David Laren. I really like. I love that Ike Ubo was kind of came up, but Akinola is injured. I don't think a lot of Canadians were going to trust what Cavallini can do anymore. So I think getting that extra striker in there, knowing that we play with a two striker system, will be important. And uh, Jefferson's an exciting young talent, and I'm hoping Canada can convince him. Another young talent that has been on the scene in MLS, Buchanan. Talk a little bit about him, his most recent move, where he's at in the depth chart. You know, will you know how in the next window, how will he be used? Yeah, Tejon is an, an I mean, I was lucky enough again when I started really getting into to covering the national team, it was right at basically Olympic qualifying when he kind of sure. got that brace and, and got got on on notice. And then watching him play for for the Revs has been incredible, seeing his development, seeing what he did in the Gold Cup. He was mostly used in that 3-5-2 at the beginning as a wing back, but we've had plenty of different systems. We've seen him as attacking midfield on the left, on the right. Um, even in that Mexico game, tracing the game, he had the freedom to kind of go all over the park. So he, we've seen him at right back for the Revs as well. He's just a very versatile, very talented uh, young player, and he obviously got that nice move to Club Bruges. I was personally pushing for him to go to the Bundesliga. He was linked with Freiburg and in Augsburg, and I really wanted him to make that move to Freiburg, who are, who are doing so well. But it's it's a it's always a risk going in on January because you got to break your way into the team. So the one thing that Canadians can look at with Tejan is hopefully that he can go into that Club Bruce side now that there's even a new manager coming in. So it's not even going to be the favorites anymore. Um, Bruce's manager just took over at Monaco, so there'll be a fresh new coach coming in there taking a look at Tejan and hopefully he can just excite and, and get a start. But he he's best in my opinion on the wings, whether that's a three four three, whether that's a four two three one. I like him out at right attacking mid, left attacking mid, right wing, left wing. In that Belgian league, you know, Belgian league or the Air Divisie, um, you know, we, we see it time and time again. Oftentimes that can be a good introduction to European football as well. Moving on, um, January 30th, the Canadian men's national team obviously are playing the U.S. Do Canadian men's national team fans expect to beat the U.S. or are they going for a point? I mean, and again, I'm I'm a very realistic person. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I think that Canada has... The, the Canadian men's national team has really tried to broaden my horizons because it, it's so different after my lifetime of seeing us go to the Azteca, go, go sure. to, to take you guys on and would dream of getting a point. Um, and now, and a lot of new fans are getting brought in by, by this hype because it is there. There's a you lot can of, say, you could say, <laughs> no, I, I, I would be happy with a point okay. at, like me personally, I would be happy with a point at home against the U.S. I, I don't think that's a, a poor result whatsoever. I know that the starting 11 that the U.S. played against Canada was not their best. We know that time to time the U.S. has struggled. I would be happy with a point. But if you're asking the majority of Canadian national team fans, they're expecting a win. That is what okay. this group has gotten this team to do. They got them top of the octagonal right now. They're sitting with zero losses. Their, their expectations is to go against the U.S. at home and, and take three points. And I think they can. I don't know if they will. But I think if you're asking a lot of the neutrals or a lot of the, the new and, and core Canadian fans, they're saying three points against U.S. is guaranteed. Interesting. I'm not, though. So I'm you're, not. Not, you're not so rude. You're not tackle who says you're the rude Canadian. You're not so rude. <laughs> I know. Very, very Canadian. Very Canadian. <laughs> and you know, going off of that, expectations for Qatar 2022. You guys are in you know, the driver's seat right now to qualify. This is what I'm really interested in this question. And, and I'm, I'm kind of framing it all from the Canadian fan perspective. I hope you don't mind. I want to hear your, you know, perception here. Um, but we've seen the Canadian men's national team fans trash talk grow as well. So that's starting to, that's starting to come with it too. And, you know, you'll see all, all the CONCACAF teams going after it. 
Um, expectations for Qatar 2022 being realistic if you are uh, to qualify. I'd love to get out of the group. I don't. I don't think. Okay. I, I feel like that should be the. That should somewhat be. It depends because no one can know what group. I mean, we get put in the group of death. You never know. But at the same time, I've seen the U.S. get put into some pretty tricky groups, and they've they found a way to get out as well. So I think it'd be a big achievement for Canada to to one qualify because that is still the most important thing right now. And then if you make it to Qatar and you still are riding this this beautiful wave that you've created for yourselves, why not try to get out of the group and, and see what happens? It'd be so. So incredibly cool, I think, to be able to watch Canada play a, a knockout game. But I'm not going to be someone who says this team can go to this, the quarter semis finals because I don't know if they're at that level yet. But I think that they can, the way that their style, their brand of football, the way that they play, uh, the passion they have, I think there's a, a good, good chance, depending on what the group looks like, that they can get out and see what happens in the knockouts. Very realistic. And, you know, one thing I want to touch on too is producing top talent. Obviously, Canada's doing it right now um, through a number of different ways. Uh, do you think right now the structure is in place to continue to produce top talent? We'll get to the Canadian Premier League, um, but what, what are your what are your thoughts there? Because you're also looking, you know, at 2026 being a you know tri hosted World Cup too with the U.S. and Mexico, and it'd be incredible for the Canadian men's national team to have a good uh, performance there as well. So, will the team with these guys? They probably will be, but looking at that and in the future, are you set up to succeed in a decade from now? I, I think so. I think they're making the right steps now and you're seeing it. And I think a big reason is for that is you're starting to see it now in different ways. You're seeing players who came from uh, like the MLS, like Alfonso Davies. You've seen players take different routes like Jonathan David, the more um, a, a completely different route. And both players are finding so much success right now. And then on top of that, which I don't know if this really goes into it, but because of hosting a World Cup in 2026, that's a guaranteed World Cup if you're a Canadian because you're yeah. the host. That attracts dual nationals, and we've been able to convince them. Stefan Ustakio, who's able to commit dual nationals, such an important player for this side. Um, obviously, I mean, Arfield committed as well, but I mean, he was one of the, the first ones. Hoylet as well went in there. Um, there. There's so many. Buchanan was eligible to play for Jamaica. He chose Canada. There, Ike Ugbo was able was able to represent Nigeria he ch- and, and England, but chose Canada. I think the fact that we are putting together a very competitive squad that that's showing that we have a potential to qualify for 2022 on top of that you're guaranteed a world cup in 2026 the dual nationals i think will be somewhat easier to target we've been good at persuading them and some of the talent that is continually coming up and continually getting basically sold abroad like your buchanans it, it, it's cool to see and even some local guys like noble akello is, is a talented young player playing for tfc i'm excited to see if he gets a, a chance at the national team mm-hmm. if and when alistair johnson as well so i think we're definitely on the right track it just you can't take your foot off the brakes we got to continue doing what is what has been working because they're building something special right here which is why we're in, in a bit of unprecedented territory now the canadian premier league is something that i feel like doesn't get talked enough about at least here in the states i want to hear your impression on the league we know from 1992 until 2019, I believe there wasn't a league or it was kind of a mess, right? There wasn't a definitive top yeah. league, you could say. Since 2019, the Canadian Premier League is in existence. Can you t- kind of touch upon that? And ultimately, where you see this league growing? And let's just say the next 25 years. It, it's interesting. I mean, I want to see it as an opportunity to to bring young Canadians up and give them a platform to be successful. And we've seen a lot of excitement. I mean, I've obviously been able to watch the league pretty closely. I've been I live very close to Hamilton, so I've been to a bunch mm-hmm. of Forge games, met some with some of their players. I talked with Tristan Borges, who's actually after his first season, which was an incredible season, he was the MVP. He got sold to OHL over in uh, the I think they were in the in the second division in Belgium. Um, it didn't quite work out there, and he was ended up loan, loaned back to Forge, and he's still a property of them. But it, it's it's incredible to see what they've achieved in, in such a short period of time, and not not only that, but to see what they've done now on the Concacaf level of having for Hamilton Forge qualify for yeah. the the Concacaf Champions League, which I think is a big step and a big achievement from a, a good group of players. And I'm very excited to see how they do because they're they're going up against MLS clubs, which is all so familiar with with the Concacaf Champions League. But it's all going in the right direction, and you're seeing some of these players, like, for example, Joel Waterman. He took a big step moving from Calvary up to the MLS. He's now a pinnacle part of that Montreal side. And if he gets called up, he's not in this depth chart right now, which I, I'd probably I would have had him in here over Mitch Carr James, for example. But Waterman came from the CPL, and there's a good opportunity that he will get a shot at the national team one day, and he's going to be playing along the lines of that back three. It could potentially be Kamal Miller 
um, Joel Waterman at the central center back and Alistair Johnson at outside right yeah. center back. So it's, it's definitely on the right track. And I'm curious to see what it is, but I just wanted to have a professional league because it was so important for Canada to get that in there for the development of this side of, of the young players on here to maybe to, if they're not in the MLS academies, that there's another option, another route for them to do. And I think the league's been pretty successful in its early, early stages. And you're starting to see that through some of these players taking bigger steps. And I want to get ahead of ourselves, but you know, the super league talks of the past, do you think there's a chance down the road? I don't know what your, I don't need to know your thoughts on the super league. Cause that's a whole nother episode we can do. If you know, Liga Mekis, MLS, could the CPL down the road be in the talks of that? I mean, is that out of out of the realm? Oh, I I don't know. I mean, that goes to like a, a completely a, level, right? a completely different level because you have to have an in- infrastructure and you have to mm-hmm. bring something drastically to the table. So if that ever happened, I think the, the Canadian clubs would be the MLS clubs. Yeah. Um, but I it's it's interesting. A lot of people have asked me questions of like, will you ever see TFC, Vancouver, and Montreal join the CPL? No. The, the the what what the MLS has there's no reason for them to to leave that it, if they get kicked out that's a different different conversation we have but it, it still comes down to money and I think if a super league it'd be very difficult to see um, what a CPL club could potentially offer to get in those conversations um, but I, again we, we'll have to wait and see how it is it's a very very young league and I think it's accomplished so much in its short period of time. And who knows? Let's see what what Forge can do playing against the best of them. They get a take on um, Mexican side, and who knows what happens if they're going to get opportunities to, to battle that with maybe even an MLS side, which would be incredible. But uh, it, it is very early. But I I wouldn't get too far ahead of saying that the CPL club would be ever in that conversation yet. This was a question that came directly from my Discord, which is <laughs> you know, so maybe yeah, down, maybe maybe down the road. I mean, it's 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 nice to dream, and honestly, with the the growing infrastructure of soccer in North America, and especially in Canada. Down the road, every, anything's possible, right? You can't yeah. take it off the table, but um, probably in decades from now. But you, you know, it's 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 fun to dream and, and think about. Yeah, that. I mean, and you can use the MLS as an example too. Of it used to be the retirement league. Exactly. It's not. I don't think it's not. You, we just signed Insigne, for example. You're getting a lot of really talented young players coming from. <laughs> well, there you go. You're getting a lot of talented young players coming in from. Uh, coming in from a lot of different like South American clubs, Brazil, Argentina. A lot of them like to come in here and find a lot of success. Some of them have been sold on. And now, like the question that we just see in Sinje uh, Bellotti, it's it's crazy. Now, I my closest MLS team to me, but and it's not even close, is uh is Toronto. So I've been to a, a ton of TFC games over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, seen them when they were very, very poor, seen them when they were at their best. Uh I I'm a big fan of Insigne. I like I like if if I had a Serie A team, it would be Napoli. So I've watched Insigne play for his entire career. I cannot believe they pulled this off. Um, now, remember, they're part of the Maple Leaf sports, so they have a ton of money. So I, I saw some interesting tweets that were going around saying, is it the fact that Canada Canada's never had soccer so hyped up in this country, not only through the, like the Canadian women's team who just struck gold, the national team who are potentially going for Qatar, hosting a World Cup, the CPL having success, did is is Maple Leaf Sports TFC trying to capitalize on that and and help TFC get back to where they were after the disastrous season? I think it has a has a have a, a fair factor in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ultimately, I, I it's always so impressive to me to see in North America, especially the U.S. and Canada, right now these major sports owners. And not to say that you know right now Major League Soccer is on the up and up. Um, we talked about the CPL. But if you're talking about the NFL, you're talking about the NBA in particular, these ownership groups getting involved in MLS, NHL getting involved in, in you know, MLS, they want to see this league succeed, not only because it's good for their pockets, but it's good for, you know, sustained business, right? So ultimately for them, it's, and they're giving back to the community. So I, they, they know that Lorenzo Insigne is going to be a hit there. They know he's still world-class, even at his age, 30 years old. They signed him to a massive long-term contract. I think I saw he's here till he's 36 or 37. So, uh, yeah, I think it was a five-year deal. Yeah. Where's, where's Fab's tweet? Um, I think 35 will be here till. Th- 35, yeah, because he's 30 right now, which is, I mean, he, he's can, he, he's getting offered a lot of money. <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. And um and yeah, so I mean I I just it's incredible that they can have these conversations and convince a player who's in in his prime 
one of the uh, an important figure of the Italian national team who's trying to qualify for a World Cup, who just won the Euros, to make that jump over to the MLS and be a pivotal part of this TFC side. I wonder how much of it has to do with Sebastian Giovinco having success at TFC, um, play style, and also still being considered for the Italian national team too in the past, right? Yeah, the, the atomic ant, my boy. I've seen him play a ton <laughs> as well, um, which is interesting because I don't. A lot of people, at least from what I remember, he didn't have much of a national team career because he didn't play a lot at Juve. He, I remember him bouncing back and forth. I think he had some good, decent seasons at Parma. Um, but he didn't quite make it at Juve and he just decided to go go for broke and made that jump over to MLS where he completely became from a, a fringe player to a pivotal part of a up and coming. I mean, he loves Toronto, loves being a part of that. There's rumors of him coming back as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming Jovenko had some talks with Insigne and, and probably told him the pros and cons of making this move. And I'd, I'd assume that there's been some type of influence that Jovenko would have had on Insigne. All right, and my last question of the day. I got to bring it back, bring it all back to the U.S. men's national team at some point. We did too much talking about the Canadian men's national team. Gio Reina, how's our guy doing over there right now? I know he's been injured, but he's back, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the number one question I've been asked for months from U.S. fans. So everything I'm going to say, I'm just going to put like a grain of salt because <laughs> uh, it, it, there's been so many reports saying, okay, he's coming back at this date, now this date, now this date. And every single time he's been put back, he looks to be on track. He looks... To, I'm saying I'm hoping he's going to be able to start a game for Dortmund in January, um, but it, it's the signs are looking better. But again, like this is it's just been so such a weird season for Gio because it, it, there's been some question marks about obviously keeping players fit and then having Gio continually looking like he's so close to being back and then to be basically out for the entire first half of the season is 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 terrible. Like it, it sucks for him, but. From what I understand, man, January is hopefully going to be his time to return, get back, and uh, now he's got a job to break into a starting 11 um, from an up-and-down Dortmund team. So I think he'll be up for the fight and uh, hopefully getting some time over this Bundesliga break to, to continue to get healthy and hopefully get in some minutes as well. Yeah, and he's the best 11 guy for the U.S. too, but of course, you know, he has been playing, so there's that whole side of too, getting back in camp when healthy. That's interesting to see too. But JJ DTV, there I said it right this time. <laughs> Josh, thank you so much for coming on today. I really do appreciate it. Not a problem, my man. I appreciate you having me on. It was a good conversation. We'll have to do it again. And I hope I didn't offend you with this. You're not. You are not the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither is the Canadian men's national team. You know, it's the, it's a healthy rivalry that's that's brewing here. Yeah, it's okay. I blame tact for most of it, anyway. So it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll be good. <laughs> All right, take care, man. Everyone, stay safe as always. Go USMNT, and most importantly, keep supporting your local soccer team. Take care, guys. Thank you.